My name is Roman Kagan. I uh, work for Virtuoso, and um, uh, yesterday we, we had a number of talks on uh, improving the security of QMU and KVM, uh, in particular. Uh, an interesting talk from uh, Steve Radford uh, about uh, tightening the, the KVM, uh, reducing the, the attack surface. Today I'll be getting bored on a, on a different subject, which is basically going in the opposite direction. Uh, adding features and what broaden the tax surface. Actually, we, we already have uh, one CV discovered by the Google team. Uh, so we have already one bad point on our track record. But that's like... <laughs> okay. Um, I'll be talking about um, uh, implementing uh, VMBus, or, uh, which is more uh, correctly probably uh, named the Hyper-V emulation uh, in the Google the devices part uh, in QQ and KVM. Uh, let, me, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, I uh, work for the company which is which uh, is now called Virtuoso. Uh, changed its name uh, already two times during my work there uh, since 2002, uh, 2005, and I uh, did different things there, uh, ranging from uh, uh, automated testing through developing the parallels proprietary hypervisor uh, and now I'm working for the team developing the open source QMU KVM based virtuoso hypervisor which is now uh, released in virtuoso server version 7. Uh, before I, I move on I'd like to, to uh, make a couple of disclaimers. Uh, I'll be using a lot of trademarks uh, I already started uh, with some of them on the uh, cover page, so uh, I uh, put the usual disclaimer that all the trademarks are the property of their respective owners. And uh, another thing is that, uh, well, this is more or less the usual thing with the open source projects, which is the only uh, authoritative and up to date documentation is the code. So, uh, Take whatever I say with a grain of salt. <coughs> okay, here's the outline. Uh, I'll uh, discuss first why we start this activity in, in Virtuoso and um, uh, what is the, the, the business case, what, why we uh, needed to, to uh, start the new. Uh, development and uh, uh, very, very um, underspecified um, uh, area, um, and then I'll consider the choices people may have uh, when setting up a Windows virtual machine on, on the KVM. Then I'll go through uh, a bit more details of the actual implementation of the Hyper-V and VMBus simulation, uh, I'll try to discuss uh, a few uh, aspects of its uh, structure, uh, uh, which is not uh, strictly layered, but has layers and components. And uh, while doing that, I'll also talk about the implementation models we have now. And, uh, I'll also uh, mention what the implementation status is, so that you can uh, get a feeling of uh, whether it's useful now or not. And then I'll conclude and give a brief outlook what you can do with this if you, could, if you go wild. So, let's consider uh, 
a user or a system administrator who is uh, tasked with setting up a virtual machine from Windows in it. Uh, he is uh, about to, he's not, he is about to, to do this many CPUs, that much RAM and uh, hard drivers, hard, hard drives this big, and uh, uh, he has the installation media with Windows, a uh, license key, and uh, well, let's assume that he's given a, an access to, to uh, the control panel of our virtual server, but it can be any, any KVM to a new based hypervisor. So what, what does the user want? want uh, in no particular order, because for different workloads people want different things, but uh, the three most important ones are performance. People want uh, virtual machines to uh, deliver uh, reasonable performance uh, compared to, to bare metal. Uh, they want it to be easy to, to, to deploy, to make an uh, initial setup. And people want uh, the whole thing to be supported. So let's see what the user can do with this. Uh, how, how, uh, what to choose from, and what promises are made from, from every choice. So uh, the first and most obvious thing is to, to do um, emulation of the real hardware, so set up a virtual machine with, say, uh, e uh, 1000 network interface and IDE uh, hard drives. And that's nice because you can do it immediately with the installation that you have. Uh, you have it supported, provided the, the hypervisor vendor did its homework. I'll talk about it later a bit. But uh, you don't get the performance. And uh, people who downloaded the uh, virtual machines from uh, Microsoft to run in the <coughs> Um, in virtual uh, in virtual box or whatever, usually notice that it's that slow because it's configured with either ID, uh, hard drive, and uh, some sort of supported network interface, and that's really slow. <coughs> Why is that? Well, the, uh, the answer is not to most of them, but I'll quickly go through it. The there are significant difference between uh, running. Uh, operating system in a virtual machine compared to physical machine. In a physical machine you have all the CPUs and all the RAM you control, all of that. Uh, you can uh, have more or less predictable timing on, on many operations. So you, uh, you know when they complete and they, uh, when you uh, to time out them. Uh, in a virtual machine uh, things go absolutely different. The virtual machine can be preempted, it can be swapped out, and most importantly, uh, many things become uh, prohibitively, prohibitively uh, expensive, very costly. Uh, APEC access, uh, input operations like uh, uh, port IO or memory map IO, uh, access to MSRS, and so on. So, the, the way uh, usual devices are implemented just doesn't make it for uh, efficient, efficient uh, running in a virtual machine. So the usual answer to this is our virtualization. Uh, so that you want to, to be able to do most of the operations without switching the context from the guest to the uh, host or vice versa and only, only do it when it's really necessary, when you need to notify the other side that it has more work, work to do. So the uh, um uh, choice of virtualization is Vort.io in, in uh, QMU and KVM, and it's really performant, uh, and people keep working on that and improving, further improving that. 
it's really nice and you can set up a virtual machine with uh, with the um, Virtio uh, net device, Virtio SCSI storage, or um, oh, I'm leaving uh, other devices which are relevant uh, for some place to just mention two of them. And you can do all this and you get performance with the uh, Windows uh, virtual drivers, which are found on this link, it's actually clickable on the uh, presentation slide. So uh, that's that's good. You get one, you get one point, but uh, things are getting hard when you want to deploy it because uh, you need to uh, provide some kind of drivers for the guest. Uh, usually, uh, well, so far, uh, virtual drivers are not cheap with the uh, Windows installation media and probably will never be shipped because uh, of license incompatibilities. So uh, you have to somehow provide the drivers to the guest. This is mitigated somehow when uh, people run virtual machines in um, uh, hosting environments because nobody actually sets up uh, his virtual machine from scratch. Typically, uh, there are Specially educated uh, system administrators who know how to, to set things up, and then virtual machines are cloned from uh, one master image. But still, it's extra work to do uh, for, for the deployment part. Uh, there are also other use cases, for example, when you download a, a virtual image, uh, a virtual machine image from a different source that you can control. You wanted to have uh, the drivers for the virtual hardware on board and uh, you don't necessarily have it so you need to play nasty tricks like doing V2V conversion uh, with link SFS and so on which is uh, usually very risky operation uh, and you, you can never guarantee the, the end result so it's already uh, red cross here but the most important thing is Support. As I said, uh, the virtual drivers are GPL, are supported by, are maintained by uh, uh, nice Red Hat people who are actively developing them, accepting patches, and so on. So things should be good. Unfortunately, they are not. The problem is that. Um, so what's what's wrong with with uh, this stuff? The problem is that uh, when you run a virtual machine with Windows, with Windows uh, usually you want support from Microsoft. And to get support from Microsoft, you want to run it on a supported configuration. To get it supported, you need to certify it. And the certification process involves getting all the drivers inside, the, uh, inside Windows to be uh, qualified, uh, qualified, uh, people qualified, so they have to pass through the uh, certification process, the drivers themselves, then you need to uh, pass the call team, the hypervisor and the uh, driver system uh, through SVP certification, and only then you can get support. But the problem is that uh, you really can do uh, we call certification if you if you take GPL drivers from somewhere else. You only have to own it. Only then you, need, you can uh, do dual license and the uh, GPL for uh, licensed uh, version will live its own life and your uh, version which you got on Winkle will live its own life. So we we had to uh, to struggle with this. We didn't know what to, to answer to this until we, we came to another review. We tried to uh, do emulation of the Microsoft Zone hypervisor, which is Hyper-V. And if you can do this, we get performance, because it's uh, more or less equivalent in, in uh, ideology to Virtual. So the performance should be reasonable, it becomes easier to deploy because you normally get it on the installation media 
with Windows, and now you get support, provided you do your homework and pass the SVP certification. So that sounded like a plan, and we started to work on that. So I hope that's, that's, um, that, that more or less explains why we started all this. So let's see how we can do this. If we have enough data to, to start implementing it. Uh, actually, we do. We think we do. Uh, there are a number of sources of this. Uh, one is the uh, documentation which is uh, published by Microsoft on GitHub. And this link is clickable again. Uh, another more, uh, more important part is that uh, Microsoft and, his, and its uh, Microsoft Plus Linux strategy um, started to push uh, guest drivers uh, into Linux and now uh, they are settled there. And we thought that we could use the source code to implement the host part. And uh, of course, trial error has to be employed here because the implementation published by Microsoft occasionally worked, but the uh, Windows implementation did because uh, there are errors in the spec which were implemented in the Linux driver, but uh, the actual Windows driver didn't work like that. Okay. So let's see uh, what uh, what components we had to to do to to enable Hyper-V parameterization and Hyper-V emulation in in the KVM and KVM. Uh, in fact, we had quite a few, uh, as they call it, enlightenments already implemented. I'll cover some some of them. Uh, Besides, we needed a few more management MSRs, synthetic MSRs, which are used by uh, uh, various Hyper-V drivers. Uh, it uh, turned out to be important to, to implement VFS, uh, VFS uh, device drivers. Uh, then, uh, a keystone of this is synthetic, synthetic interrupt controller which I will go through uh, in, in, uh, in detail. Uh, on top of that, there are timers, which are also used by the event uh, devices, so we have to implement them. Then uh, there are a few more hypercalls, which are used by, uh, by the bus device drivers too. Then the VM bus itself, and Finally, the, the devices. So let's go through them one by one. Pre-existing environments. Th those weren't implemented by us, but they, they lived uh, in uh, mainline KVM for, for quite a bit of time. Uh, in particular, there were a few uh, management MSRs, like uh, uh, guest OS ID, uh, uh, virtual processor number, and so on. There have been, been already implemented the hypercal infrastructure, which is used for uh, a single hypercal, but quite useful, uh, specifically uh, the one in the next bullet, which is a scheduler helper, so that when um, a guest CPU uh, takes a spill lock and uh, can make progress for a long time, it releases the uh, uh, the control to, to, uh, to the hypervisor. Uh, then uh, uh, a few uh, alignments to the local API, which were uh, MSR access to the most frequently used um, uh, API uh, registers that were uh, end of end drop, uh, drop control register and TPR as priority register, which uh, uh, are the most uh, frequently accessed one, ones. And uh, another one is uh, uh, APIC assist page. This is the same technology as um, paravirtual, uh, virtual, paravirtualized uh, end of interrupt, uh, uh, which is implemented in uh, 
gave in for Linux guests, uh, some call it lazy uh, EOE, EOI, uh, I, uh, and this has already been done uh, before we, we uh, started to work on that. So we added a few more. Uh, first, uh, the, the law from was uh, the management MSRs, which were reset MSR, panic MSRs, which allowed to, uh, uh, the guest to, to post uh, its uh, uh, blue screen of death uh, information uh, for post-mortem analysis and, and the report uh, that it crashed. And uh, VP runtime uh, MSR, which allows the guest to uh, get better feeling of how it uh, takes the uh, host CPU. Uh, then goes the uh, a more, uh, tricky, tricky point. Um, Hyper-V provides partition reference time to, to its guests which is basically monotonic clock since boot in uh, 100 nanosecond uh, units. And this reference time uh, is available to guests in two, in two forms. One is the time reference counter MSR. Uh, the MSR. The downside of it is that it, uh, it's an MSR, so to read it, you need to do a VIM exit which is expensive. It's one bin exit per clock rate, but still. Uh, uh, the upside is that you don't need any, any CPU requirements for that. It's available to all uh, Hyper-V guests. Then, the more tricky part was the um, TC reference page, which is something controversial and uh, <coughs> talk about it. Um, <coughs> This is a uh, uh, paravirtual uh, shared memory clock similar to KVM clock. So the hypervisor puts uh, a few parameters for the guest to, to, to be able to interpolate uh, the clock using the, the guest TC, which on uh, reasonably modern processors is uh, uh, running const constant time. A constant rate, so you can reliably interpolate. Um, the good news is that uh, the access to this clock uh, incurs no VM exit. Uh, the downside is that invariant TC feature is required, but this is not the problem with, with the CPUs of a few years already. Uh, another point here, which is different from the KVM clock, is that there is only one per VM, so you don't need to go through the hassle of synchronizing all the KVM clocks across the virtual CPUs, like we have to in, in, in KVM. Uh, the read consistency is uh, done uh, by a sequence, sequence counter, which you access tonically, but uh, you can indicate through this sequence counter that something got what's wrong with the with the TC page uh, TC reference page uh, clock, so that the guest switches dynamically to something different. It falls back to, to reading the MSR. So if you migrate from a host where uh, invariant TC is available to another one where this invariant TC is not available, you can just put uh, secon equals zero to this uh, clock and the guest will, will go on uh, reading the MSI. Uh, one important difference is that uh, Microsoft uh, implemented no C clock semantics on this, uh, on this clock. So uh, Paul was suggested to use uh, the fallback mechanism to protect the, the, the clocks, the, the, to protect the, the data on updates from the hypervisor. The problem with this is that you need to do it in a way that uh, you not only uh, guarantee the monotonicity of this clock, but you not need to be monotonic 
with respect to the reference uh, counter clock. And that's something which we can achieve right now. We, we, are, uh, we are discussing the approaches. Hopefully this will be sorted out soon, but it still hasn't been. Okay. Uh, then goes the, uh, the core part, the synthetic interrupt controller which is the LAPIC extension. Uh, it's managed completely via MSRs. Every VCPU has 16 synthetic interrupts. Uh, the feature of this controller, one of the important features of this controller is that it allows uh, auto EOI uh, uh, semantics, that is, uh, the driver can set up uh, the interrupt to not require any any uh, acknowledgement. So once it, it is delivered, uh, it is assumed to be uh, acknowledged, and this makes things incompatible with the uh, hardware uh, virtualization of uh, Epic. This is exactly where the the problem was. Uh, when I was talking about the introduced CD, uh, and this uh, this feature is um, defeating the the security kernel in uh, Google people Google people who are working on. It. So we need to, to sort this out somehow. I hope the uh, future versions of Hyper-V may be able to work without this feature. Uh, so the implementation uh, was done by adding a new uh, type of uh, RQ routing uh, table entry, which maps the, the uh, GSI to VCPU number and synthetic interrupt number. Uh, this thing got RQFD support, so you can uh, get uh, you can signal the interrupts and get notification of the acknowledgement through through uh, an uh, mechanism. And uh, a special uh, new user space uh, type was added to be able to uh, extract the MSR, MSR values for migration. So that uh, every time an MSR is updated, you get an, uh, an exit to QMU and you can record it for, uh, for migration. Um, two other features of the Hyper-V uh, synthetic interrupt controller are the message page, which is an extra mechanism for, uh, for the interaction between the host and the guest. So every synthetic interrupt, uh, synthetic interrupt gets its own uh, slot in this page. Uh, which contains uh, the payload and the header, uh, and uh, one uh, field in this header is the, the uh, type which is exited atomically and indicates the uh, availability of this slot. So when the header was a post message, it uh, updates this uh, message type in uh, uh, atomic fashion through comparing swap uh, to some type other than none, writes the payload and delivers the interrupt. And the guest, the guest uh, reads the payload, uh, atomically clears the, the message type and delivers the uh, acknowledgement, uh, the interrupt acknowledgement or a special end of uh, message uh, MSR, uh, which is another kind of acknowledgement which is also delivered to user space through the event of the um, Another part of it, uh, of the scenic, is event flags page. This is a lightweight mechanism for uh, interactions between the guest and the host. It's used exclusively for signaling. It doesn't bear any uh, payload. And, um, well, the workflow is like this. You update the, the flag, deliver interrupt on the hypervisor side, and on the guest side, you just clear it and deliver the acknowledgement. 
So uh, the first user of this machinery is uh, timers. Hyper-V provides four timers per CPU. Each timer is configured uh, by two MSRs. And the timers work also in this uh, partition reference time. So they deliver special form of messages, which are uh, the detects uh, written here. And the interesting part is that uh, every uh, timer expiration delivers in its message not only the, uh, the fact that it's, it has expired, but also the, the uh, scheduled expiration time and the delivery time. So uh, the guest can do smart things with this information. Uh, this implementation was my, made in uh, KVM. So uh, the timers are the first to take the, the message slot if they are uh, expired. So the user space will get the, this, the access to the slot later. Um, as usual, the timers can be periodic or one shot. And for the periodic uh, timers, there can be two modes uh, lazy and period mod modulation, which in QMU. Uh, usually translated to discard policy or saloon policy policy and we at the moment we didn't bother to implement the, uh, the later so uh, only the lazy mode is, is available that's why uh, the saloon mode is great out okay another part of this picture is hyper calls uh, as I said, uh, KVM already had the implementation of Hyper-V hyper calls, but um, uh, VMBus uh, needed two more. Actually, these two hyper calls now make it um, some sort of symmetry between the uh, guest to host and host to guest uh, interactions. So the two hyper calls are host message and signal event. And we actually don't plan to process anything of that in, in, in KVM. So they are just passed through to the user space with a special subtype of the uh, Hyper-V exit. We're in the information on the, uh, the Hyper-Call. And the QMU implementation is at the moment a stub one, so it receives the, the, the exit, but doesn't do anything smart with it. Uh, the work is going on uh, on implementing it because it's necessary for VMBus to pass the devices. Now the VMBus itself, so we, we uh, write it at the, at the core part. Uh, what is VMBus? It's uh, a special kind of device uh, announced by ACPI and in, in, in a nutshell it's a messaging connection between the cost and the guest. So when the host wants to deliver, uh, to, to communicate with the guest, it uh, posts a message and triggers a synthetic interrupt, and then the, the guest wants to, uh, to communicate with the guest, it uh, issues a post message hyper call. Uh, so this connection is used to, to do various uh, management things like negotiating versions, uh, parameters and so on, capabilities, discover uh, the devices available on the VM bus by the hypervisor, provided by, by the hypervisor, set them up, and uh, most importantly set up the, uh, the data channels. So what are the data channels? The data channels are very similar to Vertio not used. So basically this is a descriptor ring, uh, which is similar, well, a set of descriptor rings, similar to Vertio V rings. Uh, there should be at least one per device, usually uh, more than one. And the signaling here is used, uh, is, is done via uh, events flag. So host to guest is uh, uh, through events like page and 
synthetic interrupt and guess the cost through, through the signal value hypercall. The main usage of this is uh, VMBus uh, uh, is the data transfer for VMBus devices, like uh, what you use in, in Vertigo. So what, what are we doing with all this? Uh, we are planning to have at least four basic types of devices implemented. These uh, are util utility devices, which are uh, are a bit like uh, some sort of a watchdog, time synchronization, VSS notifications, uh, shutdown notification, storage device, net network device, and balloon device. Uh, we will start with detailed devices because they are the simplest to implement, and we at the moment have the working prototype of that. But it is in a very ad hoc uh, variant, so uh, it needs to be ported over to the infrastructure that has landed already in the KB. Uh, the work on storage network is in the planning stage, so not a lot to, to, to say about at the moment. And so is the balloon device. So, uh, one point here also, they in order to be able to boot from uh, Vertio storage, one has to, to implement guest driver, but not for the guest operating system, but for the firmware. Uh, and the, uh, the two firmware variants are CBIOS and OVMF, and we have to, to be able to support most of them from the kernel. Once the storage devices are implemented in QNU, we will unblock this and work working on that. So let me wrap up. We have, uh, we think we have all the groundwork <coughs> done in K K KVM and QNU uh, to be able to implement the VMBus devices. Uh, the uh, implementation is being worked on, and we think that it's going to be a viable solution to make Windows guests life easier on EMU DVM. <coughs> and what we can do further is uh, performance measurements and tuning, perhaps B host integration, because uh, uh, because uh, VMBus devices are very similar to Vert.io and uh, we may be able to, to do this. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to also implement the transport for, uh, for the VSOC uh, address family. Also some more features available in Hyper-V uh, like event logging, debugging and uh, other devices should be possible too. So, yeah, that's it. Questions? Uh, quick question. Um, so you said if you if we implement this being less, uh, we no longer have to deal with Wickle. Will there be some form of certification that needs to be done to certify uh, the being less implementation with KVM? Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't need to do Weeple because the drivers will be provided by Microsoft. So uh, we'll have to do this as we That's right. The certification is necessary, but this this is something that uh, vendors can do. Uh, they, uh, the, the process for SVB certification is um, more under control of vendors. You can do GPL uh, implementation of the uh, hypervisor. You can do um, certification on your own. You can share the code, and this is uh, what we are going to do. Uh, with, uh, you don't need to well uh, to allow someone to redistribute your your code under uh, proprietary uh, license or whatever, which is what what we requires actually. So this is, this is how 
Uh, they should simplify things. Is that answer? Anything else? About this uh, VSOC that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So Huckabee has different type of sockets. That, do they use uh, VSOC? Well, actually, this is the outlook. Uh, if you go really wild, I don't know if we have enough resources to, to implement to implement this. But Huckabee does uh, um, describe some sort of uh, socket interface for the management. They uh, they name it. Um, Integration services uh, transport or something like this, and it's it's uh, it's socket based. So we hope that we'll be able to to do the host side of this, uh, looking like the uh, transport. I don't know if it works out or not. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just have one suggestion. You you talk about doing the hosting integration. Um, mm -hmm. It might be easier to do vHost user integration first because they came from the back end uh, user stuff. Quite possible. And but I have to upstream to the kernel to get it running. Absolutely, quite possible. Uh, sorry, this is not on, on the top priority list, actually. Okay. This, so we need to first to implement the devices themselves. <laughs> okay. So this would be a Gen 1 VM, right? Not necessarily. I mean, See, not even two that I mean, it has a north grid, it has a south grid, it's similar to Gen 1 more or less. Uh, this should be more like Gen 1, but uh, I think that it should be uh, compatible with Gen 2, mostly, I don't know. Uh, that we didn't have feature by feature comparison of, of the two generations, so I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, we try to uh, to see if it works with Gen 2. Uh, the basic devices do work, like a um, uh, heartbeat device. We'll see. Also talking about, uh, yesterday you uh, mentioned that we may skip uh, CBIOS integration and only provide Gen 2 interface. Unfortunately, we can't. Because our user base is interested in support of uh, is interested in support of uh, uh, two th two thousand and eight uh, Windows machines, and they do not work in Gen two VMs. I think. But uh, the problem is that twenty zero eight Windows does support uh, Hyper V out of box, so some update to. The guest will be necessary. Yeah, sure. But anyway, uh, you just can't boot uh, a Windows 2008 machine in a Gen 2 VM, even on Hackery. Or you will have to accept a hack, which they have discussed uh, in the mailing list. Uh, you have to pin uh, some part of the memory in one anyway. Any more questions? So thank you for watching.